Good afternoon, everybody. I think a couple things. A disclaimer before we go too far. I am a professional comedian of 33 years. I am a professional speaker of 16 years. I am not a mental health clinician. I'm neither a psychologist nor a psychiatrist, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So I just want to let you guys know that. I, the elephant in the room oftentimes when I do an engagement like this is, OK, let me get this straight. A comedian talking about depression and suicide. Just exactly how does that work? I actually believe a comedian is a good choice, and I'll tell you why. If you think about it, the comedian's job is and has been since the time of the Middle Ages and the court jester to speak truth to power on behalf of the powerless. So I believe my job as a comedian is to speak truth to power um, of mental illness on behalf of those often caught in its grip. Number two, I believe where there's humor, there's hope, where there's laughter, there is life, and that nobody dies laughing. And number three, I have personal experience. I have lived experience, which I will share with you a little later on. But that, that, that oftentimes I get that question, comedy, depression, suicide? Just exactly where is the connection? The, I'm sure you guys know this, so this may be a bit of a, rev of a review, review for some of you. Every year in the United States, a million people, I'm sorry, every year in the United States, eight million people, roughly, contemplate suicide. A million people, roughly, attempt it. And I think in the last year, the last year for which we have numbers, 44,000 died by suicide, which, as a matter of fact, is twice the rate of homicide. As a matter of fact, more people die from self-harm in the U.S. every year than homicide, war, and natural disasters combined. And what I find sad and fascinating is so very few people are talking about it. I mean, think about that. On that awful morning of 9-11, 3,900, I'm sorry, 3,987 people died on 9-11. 11 times that many die every year in the United States from self-harm. I just, why no commission, no government? Pro I mean, there, there are people doing good work and talking about it and working on it, but given the sheer numbers of Americans who die, and that doesn't include the 66,000 opioid deaths, and we don't know exactly how many of those are, in fact, suicide. And I find it fascinating because I've discovered in my research for the couple of TED Talks I did that the mere mention of the words depression and suicide out loud elicited the most amazing responses from people, some of whom I've just met. It's almost as if they've been waiting and waiting and waiting for somebody to give them permission to give voice to their feelings and experiences surrounding mental illness or mental health or, or depression and suicide. It's almost as if they're waiting for somebody to utter the magic, or in this case, the tragic words, depression and suicide. I was working a cruise ship. I do 12 weeks a year on Holland America as a comedian. I was in the Lido Buffet one morning, and there were, it was jammed, and I couldn't find a seat. And I look up, and there's a table for two, and there's a woman, and there's an empty chair. So I point, she nods, I sit. She looks up, she goes, hey, are you the comedian? I said, hey, did you enjoy the comedy show? She goes, I did very much. I said, then I'm the comedian. She goes, what would you have said if I told you I hated the comedy show? Uh, I'm a plumber from Des Moines. She said, are you, is cruise comedy all you do? And I get that question quite a bit, because why would they assume otherwise? I said, no, I do Holland America about 12 weeks a year. I said, the rest of the time, I'm a public speaker. She goes, what is the topic? Having had this conversation many times before, I said to her, depression and suicide, and I started to count down in my head. Three, two, one. She says, I tried to kill myself twice. We have known each other for less, I guess fewer than 60 seconds. And she, she shared that with me. <clears throat> Excuse me. She said, you know, first time was in college, somewhat half-hearted, not that serious. Second time, far more serious. I had graduated college, I had graduated medical school. I had the knowledge, had the equipment, I had the IV started in my ankle. I had the suicide cocktail in one hand, the syringe in the other. Getting ready to load it up, phone rings. She thinks, do I answer it? Well, she said, you know, I thought I better because it might be someone who would worry if I didn't pick up and would interrupt. <laughs> yeah. So she picks it up, 13 year old son. She goes, I don't know if you heard something in my voice or had a premonition, 
But the first thing he said to me was, Mom, don't do anything. She goes, so I didn't. I did not give up on the idea of suicide. However, I decided not to do it that day because I felt that, that he would realize he had spoken to me right before I did it and would always feel guilty. Wasn't there something he could say or do to stop me from ending my life? And of course, I'm sure a number of you know, there are things you can say oftentimes, there are things you could do oftentimes to stop. Um, I believe the number is eight out of 10 people who are suicidal are ambivalent. Uh, two, sometimes you know we can't save everybody. So I said to her, since I'm terminally curious, how old is your son now? She goes, he's 21. I said, does he know his phone call saved your life? She goes, no. How do you start that conversation? That became the theme of my first TED Talk because I was rolling up to a TED Talk as I was working that cruise and I couldn't quite find the right, you know, the overarching. And I realized, start that conversation. It's, I was working a golf tournament in Oregon City, Oregon. I got a call from an insurance agency group or insurance group. And the meeting planner said to me, Frank, here's the deal. This is an insurance event, golf tournament. We're drinking to follow. Nobody, none of the insurance agents, wants to stay sober enough to hand out the awards. Will you come up and MC? Sure. So I went up, I'm sitting at a table with half a dozen vendors, people that sell to the insurance business. And again, a conversation with a woman across the table. Hi, what do you do? I do you MC all you do? No, I do public speaking. What's the topic? Depression, suicide, three, two, one. She goes, you know, my mom jumped off a bridge when I was three. We just met. And, and, and at the end of our conversation, I said, do your children know that grandma had this issue? Oh, no, she said. Can you guess? How do you start that conversation? Yes, I just drove home the point that, that if you can just start the conversation, just give them you know, something for the rest of the talk about this to crystallize around. That is what is needed. So, the TED Talk, I don't know if, if you've <clears throat> ever considered doing a TED Talk, but Seth Godin in his TED Talk in 2009 called The Tribe We Lead said if you want to do a TED Talk, you need an idea worth spreading. And if you need an idea worth spreading, here's how you find it. First, you find your tribe. And for me, my tribe is people who have a mental illness and for whom the idea of suicide is always on the menu. And when I say always on the menu, I mean I, I have what's called chronic suicidality. And if you haven't heard of that, I suppose it's a little more rare than, say, just depression. It means, for me, the idea of suicide is always an option for problems large and small. Last year, my car broke down. I had two thoughts, un uh, three thoughts, unbid. One, get it fixed. Two, I could buy a new one. Three, or I could just kill myself. I know. It sounds absurd to people who are perhaps neuronormal, neurotypical, whatever. But generally when I speak, 5% of the people in the audience, it resonates. Many of whom, usually after I do a keynote, at least one person, sometimes more, comes up after the keynote. I remember this college show I did in Baltimore, 800 college students. I revealed that I have chronic suicidality. I described it. A young woman, 21, 22 years old, comes up afterwards. She goes, you made me weep. I said, how did I make you weep? She goes, when you said, get it fixed by a new one, you could just kill yourself. She said, she said, I've had those feelings all my life. And, and I didn't know there was a name for it. And I, I thought I was the only one, that I was some kind of freak. And when I heard you say that, I realized in that moment that I was not alone. And she said, I, I wept. Again, it's a matter of starting the conversation, giving people permission to give voice to those feelings and experiences without recrimination. I'm guessing she probably hadn't told that story to many people. I was in San Diego, California doing a comedy gig. In San Diego, they have the USS Midway. It's an aircraft carrier. They turned it into a museum. A million and a half visitors a year. It's a money maker. And so the docents have a big banquet every year. There are 500 of them. And I'm at the table with nine other people. You know, you guys know the classic uh, 10 top convention. I spend a lot of my life sitting down having dinner with nine strangers. 
So I'm really good at making cocktail party conversation. You know, warming everybody up. And the guy across the table from me, can you see this coming? So is comedy all you do? <laughs> no. Next question. What else do you do? I'm a public speaker. <laughs> Depression and suicide. And I went on to say, you know, I have major depressive disorder and I gave him a little thumbnail. You know, it, um, for me it's three days to two weeks, it recurs. And chronic suicidality, a little more rare. A year ago my car broke down, three thoughts, bang, bang, bang. Okay, so I'm at the bathroom, coming back to my table, he's going toward the bathroom, he stops me. He goes, Frank, I'm 69 years old. He goes, chronic suicidality, apparently, is what I have. And he, always, he said, I've never told that to anybody, that I have thoughts of suicide that often. He goes, I've never even told that to my therapist. 69. Because you have no idea the relief I feel at this moment that I could say that out loud to somebody. He said, I didn't tell my therapist because I was afraid that if I told him how often I think of suicide, he would put me in an involuntary three-day hold. Boom. Just like that. I told uh, Sarah the other day that um, I had a conversation in my head because occasionally someone will ask me, when was the last time you thought about suicide? When was the last time you thought about suicide? And I, I decided what my answer was going to be because this is the truth. Uh, what time is it? And I just can't wait to look at the expression on the person's face. What time is it? You mean like today? No, I'm like this, this morning. So because it just recurs over and over. And, over. and you know, there are the symptoms that I was not aware of. I, I had a young man come up to me at a college. I think it was Old Dominion or Lynchburg College. Comes up afterwards, African American gentleman, and he said, you know, I have thoughts of suicide all the time. Am I just looking for attention? I said, well, let's talk about your symptoms. So I'm not a clinician, but I said, let me ask you this. Ever sit, come rolling up on a railroad crossing, and the arms are coming down and the lights are flashing, and you look over at the train, and you think to yourself, if I touch the gas, I'd be on the tracks in a flash and be gone shortly after that. He goes, oh my God, you're inside my head. That's a symptom I do believe, at least from my anecdotal research, that, that, that people who have chronic suicidality, they're in a situation where they look, we're driving a mountain road. I said, you ever do this? You're driving a mountain road, kind of in that switchback. And you look over the edge and you think, eh, that would pretty, pretty much that would do it. I said, a lot of people don't think that way. You and me, all the time. So, it was a great relief to him that there was somebody else out there who had the same, now I'm not saying everybody who has chronic suicidality has either of those symptoms, but he and I shared those symptoms. Plus he has a vivid imagination, he's an amazing artist. Um, the problem for him was he came out to his family about his depression and thoughts of suicide. And they gave him a Bible and the pastor saw them. That was the, and you know, if, if you're from a family where, you know, that, a strong religious background, that would seem logical, but he was still reaching out for, and his parents were big in the church, and he was worried that their reputation would suffer as members, high-ranking members of the church, if they had a child who was flawed. And so I said, well, you know, on campus here, they do have a counseling facility. I would, I would go see them here, not somebody back home. Go see them and, and get evaluated, see what they say. Again, he was just, you know, just relieved to be able to come out and tell somebody else that who understood. There was a young woman in the back of the room at Lynchburg College. I'm watching her, she's watching me. I'm doing my keynote. She comes up afterwards. Okay. Now bear in mind, we're in the middle of the Me Too movement. I'm 61, she's a co -ed. She goes, can I give you a hug? I'm looking around the room and everybody's got a cell phone with video capabilities. You know, I can just see it on YouTube. Um, uh, you know, predatory speaker takes advantage of co-ed who's mentally ill, you know. I said, okay, so I gave her a very brotherly hug. I said, are you normally a hugger? She goes, no. No, I don't hug anybody. She goes, but I'm sitting in the back of the room. I've been going to see a clinician for six months. And she is extremely talented. She knows her stuff. 
And she's good. However, she doesn't, as far as I know, live with a mental illness. So she has trouble wrapping her mind around what I'm going through. She goes, I'm sitting in the back of the room listening to you. Those 45 minutes listening to you were more valuable to me than the six months I spent with her. Because I'm back there thinking, this guy is inside my freaking head. Again, that's the advantage. That's, that's the advantage of speaking out. That's the advantage of sharing your story, I believe, with other people. They know they're not alone. They've had similar feelings. They can come up without worrying about recrimination and share that with you. Just get it off their chest. So, anyway. So, I did the TED Talk. Oh, the idea we're sharing. A tribe and a vacuum. Vacuum I've already mentioned. Not nearly enough people are talking about it. Which, again, I find fascinating because it's just mentioning it out loud. Okay, so. Now, I mentioned that I, in addition to being a comedian and a professional speaker, I have lived experience. Generational depression and suicide runs in my family. I did not know that until 2012, I think. I'm 61 years old. My great aunt, well, my, my grandmother had died by suicide. I knew that. And my mother had found her. And my great aunt had died by suicide. My grandmother's sister. And my mother and I had found her when I was four years old. And I was told that when they found her, she was... You know, it was very serene. Her hands were folded in prayer. She decided to depart this veil of tears. And my cousin, who's 10 years older, when I rec recounted that story to him about her hands folded in prayer, <clears throat> I will spare you the details. But I will tell you what he said. Hands folded in prayer, my ass. <laughs> and then proceeded to share the story with me, which I had no conscious memory of. I had walled it off. And when he got to the end of the story... The, the bricks in that wall in my head tumbled away and it all came back. I realized he was telling the truth. And then I came awfully close in 2010. There was a high of the recession. Professional speaking dropped off 80%. My income dropped off 80% overnight. My wife and I lost everything we'd worked to, you know, to collect toward retirement or whatever for 25 years in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And, and I... I had an itch on the roof of my mouth I could only scratch with, you know, the front side on my 38. And, spoiler alert, I didn't pull the trigger. I said that to a friend of mine, somebody sir had met, Glenn Friesman. When I told him that part about I hadn't pulled the trigger, he said, why didn't you pull the trigger? I said, could you try to sound a little less disappointed? <laughs> <laughs> See, now people often say, how can, you, how can you do comedy and talk about depression and suicide? I'm not bolting jokes onto this keynote. These are jokes that are organic in the story. Glenn actually said that to me, and I actually said that back to him. There, there, there is humor at the darkest moments if you know what you're doing, if that makes sense. And, and people ask, why do you do that in a 45-minute keynote? It's hard to talk about suicide, depression, mortality, morbidity for 45 minutes without giving the audience some sort of relief along the way. You know, and, and um, I've been busted for, for poking fun. You're poking fun at mentally ill people. You shouldn't be doing that. I said, here's the deal. Um, you can make fun of or poke fun at any group to which you belong. If I had no issues, then I would be in deep trouble for saying some of the things I do. But, you know, I... So speaking out is not worry-free. There are pitfalls. You are going to get pushback. Somebody said to me, um, and I think they were incredulous, because if you're high-functioning and a comedian and happily married and, you know, you've got a good career and nothing really to outwardly to be depressed about, really? You came that close to dying by suicide? How close? <laughs> okay. In every comedian's head, I hear two voices. The devil on one shoulder, say it. The angel on the other, he may pass out. So when he said, how close, I heard, say it. So I said, close enough to know what the barrel of my gun tastes like. And it stopped him in his tracks. It, it, every now and then, I've had it with... <laughs> 
you know, people not believing or incredulous or, you know what I mean? Or how bad was it? Or could it how could it have been so bad you wanted to kill yourself? My personal favorite is, I came close to, you know, to pulling the trigger. A friend where we lived found out about it. He said to me, you know, if you'd pulled the trigger, you'd gone to hell. Say it. I said, here's what you don't know. I was already there. You wanted to die? No. I wanted to end the pain. Here's why I didn't pull the trigger. I had a million dollars in life insurance. A million. Every life insurance policy has a two-year suicide clause. It's actually called the non-incontestability non, clause, but colloquially known as the suicide clause. If you die by suicide in the first two years, they pay nothing. They return the premiums. Two years in a day, a million dollars. And I, as I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people who are that close to suicide, felt like I was a burden. That if I died by suicide, my wife would get a million dollars. She would be brokenhearted, yes. But the farm would not go to the bank. She would be restored financially. Her life, except for me being ripped out of it, would not be changed that much. So I called my insurance agent, a kind, caring, and apparently very perceptive gentleman named Graham Benson. And the people who have an issue tend to be good actors. So I put on my, I have a SAG card, Screen Actors Guild. So I put on, hey, Graham, how's it going? He was somewhat aware of my financial situation, uh, not really aware of my mental situation. So about two thirds of the way through the conversation, I said to him, hey man, how long have I had that life insurance policy? I don't know, I'll check. I can hear him clacking on the keys. Comes back on the phone, he goes, it's 22 months and no, don't do it. Life insurance agent, this is not the first time he's had that phone call. And he's lost clients whose policy was longer than, you know, had had it longer than two years. And when he hung up the phone, he said to his wife, I think Frank is going to die by suicide. I really do. But I couldn't. People think oftentimes when you are that close to, a, to suicide, your rational brain is gone. I don't think that's always the case because there's part of me that wanted me gone. But there, my rational brain, still operating, would refuse to allow me to do that and leave my wife not only brokenhearted, but destitute. People say, you know, I got two months to live. I had two months to die. And by the time two months had gone by, I sort of had broken the surface of my depression. The bankruptcy had gone through, so the, you know, the financial pressure was off. We were able to save our little house down in Oregon, which was where we live. <clears throat> One of the benefits, by the way, of a bankruptcy is you're able to drill down to what is really important, what you really need. And it either destroys a marriage or drives you closer together. And fortunately, my wife and I will celebrate 31 years of marriage this summer in July. July 4th, by the way, my wife chose it because she wanted to be guaranteed of fireworks on her wedding night. <laughs> I chose it because July 4th is Independence Day and I could not resist the irony. Also, it makes you very, I think, I'm, I think a bankruptcy and that sort of trauma makes you more compassionate and empathetic. And I had a GPS at the time. You guys remember the GPS, got a little screen on there. This is before Google Maps was a big deal. And it sucked to the, you know, the windshield. And on the GPS was a little house. And, it, and rather than punch in your address to go home, you just punch house. And for quite some time after the bankruptcy, because, you know, we were able to save that little house down in Oregon where my wife grew up, so we had a place to go. I'd be coming home from Portland. I'd reach up and touch that house. And I would cry. Because I had some place to go. I had a house. We also had eight cats and three dogs. And nobody's going to rent to you. So <laughs> that, was, that was part of my relief. Oh, dear God, we've got three dogs and eight cats. We lost a farm, by the way. We had a um, half dozen barn cats. And a lot of people, when they lose a property like that or sell a property like that, they leave the cats behind. But my wife's father was a Marine, career Marine. 
And I knew, even though he was gone, that if I left a man behind, he would haunt me for the rest of my days. So I got the live trap, and some of them were not happy about coming. They were happy once we got there and settled in, but we left no cat behind. We, we're like the Marine Corps, we leave no man behind. I think empathy is, empathy is the sticking point for most people who have not dealt with these issues. You know, most people are compassionate, they want to help, they're solution-oriented, and they, but I, I think they have difficulty wrapping their mind around depression, thoughts of suicide, whatever it happens to be, whatever you're dealing with. And, matter of fact, I advise people. Somebody said to me in a Q&A after one of these, so if somebody is, you know, they, they believe it's close to suicide, what do you do? I said, well, I, your job as a mental health first responder at that moment, get them on the phone with a suicide prevention lifeline, or have them text hi to 741-741. I said, if they're not in crisis, they're just, you know, depressed, whatever. Have them call another person who battles the same thing. Because what I found is, normal people are solution oriented. You call a normal person who, and you tell them you're struggling with this, they want to help, they want to solve the problem. You know? And you're going to get like, have you tried fish oil? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whereas a person who, you know, a friend of mine named Sarah, who is double diagnosed, alcoholic and depressed. I told her this story. She goes, Frank, here's the deal. And forgive the vulgarity. She goes, I'm going to call somebody like you, she said, who knows what I'm going through. Because you know what you'll do for me? You will listen and you will simply co-sign my bullshit. <laughs> You'll just go, oh, that sucks. Oh, dear God, I can't believe that. Ah, oh, ah, oh, oh, without making a suggestion. You won't should all over me. You should do this, and you should do that, and you should do this, and you should do that. So, I just want somebody to co-sign my BS, just to say, that is, that sucks. That really sucks. Uh, oh, empathy. I cannot describe to people how deep and dark and awful Depression is. I said to my wife at one point, if you could get inside my head and walk around for an hour when I'm in that, you know, maelstrom sliding downward, you would come out screaming. That's why when somebody says about someone who died by suicide, they took the coward's way out. I say to them, do you have any idea how difficult it was for that person, chances are, to simply get out of bed in the morning every day, paste on a smile, put one foot in front of the other until it was social, a socially acceptable time to go back to bed and pull the, the covers over their heads. Do you have any idea the courage involved in that simple act every day, day in, day out? And people do that, for, you know, oftentimes for years. And, and don't necessarily die by suicide. They die of natural causes. Or yeah, I just... Or it was a selfish act. At the same dinner in San Diego, the gentleman next to me, his son had died by suicide. And he said it was selfish because of all the pain and destruction you left behind. And I said, I understand your feelings. I understand why you feel that way. I can see why you would feel that way. But know this. When I was that close, I thought, rather than a selfish thought, of simply ending my pain, the other side of that was, I am a burden. The world will be better off without me. So it's not necessarily simply a selfish act. I didn't convince him, and I didn't challenge, I said, I know why you feel the way you do, but just bear that in mind. That's how I felt when I was that close. I was doing my wife a strange favor, as it were. The best way I can describe depression is this. A metaphor or simile. You guys remember the old diving outfits, big round globe, with the tubes that go up to the surface? They always came with a pair of lead-filled boots. I tell people, that's what depression feels like to me. It's like I have to strap on those lead-filled boots. And I look outside, somebody's turned down the color and the contrast and turned up the force of gravity. It's so all I can do to get out of bed, strap on the lead-filled boots, put one foot in front of the other, 
until it's time, a socially acceptable time to go back to bed. Because the bed talks to me all day long. I've actually been depressed, made the bed, turned back to the bed, and said, won't be long, I'll be back. <laughs> it just, you know, all day long my brain's going, look, you got the Ozark on Netflix. You haven't seen an episode. It's a great series. Call back in bed. Let's binge watch. You don't have to put up with this. Again, somebody said to me, here's how depression and other mental illnesses. Every morning when you get out of bed, there's a rock and a hill. Sometimes the rock is small. The hill is not so steep. Sometimes the rock is big and the hill is steep. But there's always a rock and there's always a hill. Just a matter of degree. That's, that I think I think it's an act of courage to get out of bed every morning when that is what you're facing every day, and don't want to burden your. Why didn't he tell me he was depressed? Why didn't he tell me he's having thoughts of suicide? My guess, didn't want to burden you with it. Probably nothing you could do about it, and didn't want to ruin your day. I know that's an irrational thought, but I've had those thoughts. I go at, you know, had that thought last week. I should tell my wife I'm spiraling down. I thought, you know what? It's not going to make me feel any better, and it's just going to make her feel worse. Because there's nothing she can do about it. So I kept it to myself. Now, if I'd been in crisis, you know, if I had an HR roof in my mouth, and I was doing, yeah, you know, I would, you know, shout from the rafters, hey, listen, hold up, before you go to work today, I just need a little favor. Uh, I got a ride to the Johnson unit there at the hospital in Eugene. I could use a little three day vacation. Um, oh, I had somebody in one of my speeches said they can't imagine being. Uh, locked down for three days. I've had times in my life when, you know, somebody said to me, look, we're locking you down for three days. Really? Three hots in the car, three days? Somebody else look after everything? All right. I got a shotgun. <laughs> Let's go. I mean, the, you know, there are times in my life when it's just so overwhelming that three days, somebody else, you know, picking up the tab for the food, the uh, clean bed to sleep in, uh, would be like a vacation. I know you're locked down, you can't leave, but never been where you are mentally. And I don't mean to make light of three-day involuntary homes. I mean, it's for, you know, they serve a purpose, probably save a life. It's, you know, it's a mixed blessing. It's not, not a panacea, but as my mom would say, on that happy note, <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> sorry. I know. You know, when, when you grow up in a family like that, where everybody, every, pretty much everybody in my family, by the way, is on one psychotropic medication or more. And here's the upside for the next generation. All the uh, nephews and nieces and everybody know that we all have these issues. So if they have an issue, they're not afraid to come out to the family. You know, it's not, not a secret that Uncle Frank, you know, is just a bubble off plum occasionally. They're more likely to come to me and go, Uncle oh, Frank, listen, remember that thing you said about, and I'm kind of having the same feelings, and do you have any idea? So, it, that's the upside, is that we're all very much out of the closet, as it were, on, on our issues. Anxiety, depression, you know, generational depression, so so. Uh, here's the upside. Evolutionary advantages of mental illness, organization, rumination, peregrination, isolation, hibernation, and wait for it. Procreation. Nothing sells like sex. Well, here's the deal. Here's how I created this. When I would talk to somebody on the ship, let's say, and I would tell them that I spoke on depression and suicide, three, two, one, you know, my son, first paragraph's always depressed or bipolar or dyslexic or autism. And the second paragraph always started like this. But you know what? He's amazingly creative. He's artistic. He's funny. Smart beyond belief. They are. The second paragraph is always chock full of these abilities beyond what the average person might have. So I began to wonder, as I saw the pattern, if there wasn't a connection between mental illness, per se, and mental ableness. What if those of us with a diagnosis of mental illness are not living with a genetic mutation, but an amazing evolutionary adaptation? What if, as in Malcolm Gladwell's book, David and Goliath, mental illness is in fact a desirable disadvantage. And if that is the case, what if we treat the mental illness, therapy and medication, and we embrace, enhance, energize, and celebrate the mental ableness? 
What would be the impact on a child if you could convince them? Reframe it for them. Yes, you have a mental illness, but here's the good news. It's only half of the package. The other half of the package is this amazing mental ableness, superpowers, if you will, that your peers, neurotypical or whatever, can only dream of. What would the impact be on an adult who'd been living with that label all their lives? And, and they discover at age whatever, they're not special needs, they're actually gifted and talented. When I told my little sister about superpowers, because she's very funny as well, <laughs> you know, having superpowers, she goes, yeah, we're not the X-Men, we're the Xanax men. <laughs> that's, that's my lovely little sister. And then I began to feel sorry, believe it or not, for my neurotypical or neuronormal pals or peers. Because I thought, and I believe firmly, that my major depressive disorder and chronic suicidality is simply the flip side of my sense of humor, my creativity, my vivid imagination, my ability to make a living doing stand-up comedy and professional speaking for 33 years full time. And I always thought that people processed information because we all see and hear the same things. I figured everybody processed them the same way. I'll give you a, I'll give you a comedy example. I'm on a flight, flying through Atlanta on Delta. Have you flown Delta? Extremely Southern flight attendants. The FAA has just changed the regulations. Now, it's about a year or two ago, you can use your iPhone or iPad on takeoff or landing if you have it in the airplane mode. Well, the problem for the flight attendants is that's not written down anywhere. It's a brand new rule. Now, they could do the pre-flight safety thing, the ordinary one, in their sleep. But they're going to have to, you know, manufacture whatever they're going to say about the iPad iPhone. So she's going through the, you know, the uh, oxygen mask and floor path lighting, you know, and the, and the seat cushion. Yeah, and she gets to that part where I know she's got to say something about the new rule. So I'm on the edge of my seat. Because, you know. <laughs> and she, she goes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, due to a new FAA regulation. And you can almost hear her thinking. And then she gets inspired. If you have small equipment, you can continue playing with it. <laughs> I'm on the plane double over laughing. The only one. My seatmate looks at me and he goes, what? I go, let's review. <laughs> she comes back on, she goes, if you have large equipment, well, you're gonna have to shove that under the seat in front of you. <laughs> so I'm down on my knees and, uh, and I realized at that moment that we all heard the same thing. I just process it differently. I made the mistake of telling a friend of mine, Kent Rader, about a day, how I daydream. And I do believe it's part of my pathology, whatever. It's, it's part of my superpower. My daydreams, you guys ever see the movie Walter Mitty? It's Walter Mitty movie with um, Secret Life of Walter Mitty. And there was an original one. Then the recent one was Ben Stiller. Okay. Those, that's how I daydream. I'm always the hero in the piece. You know, I always get the bad guy. And it's, it's not just as simple as that. Because of my imagination, when I start out on one of those, it's like I'm, I've, uh, Anne Marie would appreciate this, our videographer and Devin, I've got blocking and lighting and dialogue and, and there's a, it's like chapters and epilogue and sound bites. And I, I'll spare you, I know nobody likes to hear about anybody's dreams, so I'll keep this brief. But I picture myself in a 76 station that I usually, usually get my gas. It's, it's the middle of the night, I'm, I'm getting gas going up to Portland to catch a flight, I'm pouring a cup of coffee. Guy comes in with a handgun and a mask, and he's robbing a guy behind the counter. And I'm down there making my coffee. And he's screaming at me to come down there, and I'm just making my coffee. <laughs> and I leave the lid off. I'm preparing. Walk down, and he looks at me and goes, you're crazy. And I say, thanks for noticing. <laughs> Pretty much everybody in town knows that. Right, Cole? Guy behind the counter. Oh, yeah. Guy's nuttier than a 25-pound bag of squirrel feed. Uh, and the guy with the gun goes, if you don't give me your wallet, I'm going to pull the trigger. And I start laughing. <laughs> and he's like, why are you laughing? Dude, look, I've been working up the courage to pull the trigger for decades. 
If I'd known you were going to do it this day, this time, you know how much time, effort, energy, and worry I could have saved just knowing it was coming to an end at a 76 station on whatever date? And, you know, then I throw the coffee on him. It's hot. Hit him in the throat. He drops. Hand the gun to the guy behind the counter leave. Epilogue. I get back to the airport. Of course, cops are waiting. Mr. King, did you have a little incident at 76 station that night? Yeah. Well, good, you know, the news is the guy that you hit in the hospital, but he'll recover. Well, hey, you can't win them all. You've got no problem with that? Okay, look, good guy one, bad guy zero. I can live with that. So <laughs> my friend Kent goes, oh, dear God, I've got to get better daydreams. <laughs> at which moment I realized not everybody daydreams that way. You know what I mean? It's just, it, it's part of that imagination. Oh, Kent, by the way, battles his own. He has, did I tell you he has OCD? I guess we didn't talk about this. He has OCD, but he didn't know that until he was 21. Can you imagine living all those years with those sorts of behaviors? And it was sort of the Jack Nicholson, as good as it gets, OCD. Not a lot of cleaning rituals. I remember getting in his car one day, and I'm like, what kind of OCD are you? <laughs> and he goes, the other kind. Yeah, so he, the only diagnosis, by the way, he had until he was 21 was from his grandfather who said, and I quote, that boy's effed in the head. <laughs> that was his official diagnosis. So here's the, here's the start of the conversation story from talk radio. He's listening to talk radio. They've got an expert on OCD on the radio with the host, and they go, we got a checklist. And so Kent's listening as he's driving, got nothing else to do. So they have 10 things. He goes, uh, you know, if you have six or ten, out of 10 of these, you probably have OCD. And Kent's going, check, 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 all 10. Boom, solid. He said the relief to know A, it had a name, B, he wasn't alone, C, there's lots of people with the same condition. Now, he has two children and a lovely wife who puts up with him. because She bought in. I mean, she knew going in he had this. Kids, and you figure kids don't really notice what adults are up to, how things. He's on a plane with his son who's eight years old. Flight attendant says, if you are traveling with a child, put your mask on first, then put your mask on the child. Put the mask on the child. His son at eight years old looks at Kent and says, Dad, we both know that's not going to happen. Kent goes, how do we know that's not going to happen? He goes, because you're going to be busy cleaning your mask while I pass out. <laughs> oh, my God. And you know what? I don't believe it's just powered my comedy career. I believe my sense of humor, which I believe is the flip side of whatever else I deal with, has saved me in other areas of my life. I was 12 years old. My dad died at age 40 of a heart attack. So, and my mother worked. I was something of a latchkey kid. So I was essentially pedophile bait. On paper, I was the ideal candidate for a pedophile. And I went to the YMCA, which turns out was a nest of pedophiles. Yeah, pedophilia is sort of like real estate. It's location, location, location. And pedophiles tend to hire one another, promote one another, cover for one another. So the outgoing youth director, pedophile, now in jail, hired the incoming pedophile, youth director, Wayne, now deceased, yeah, <laughs> which I don't have a problem with. Um, and I'm in his office one day, and just he and I, and he said this to me, Frank, have you ever been involved in group masturbation? As my mother would say, apropos of nothing, I said, Wayne, you know what? I never really considered masturbation a team sport. <laughs> For me, it's more of an individual sport like golf. <laughs> he laughed until he cried and never bothered me again. A friend of mine who studies pedophilia said, I'll tell you why I didn't bother you, Frank, because any child age 12 who has the presence of mind to deflect a comment like that and make it funny is nobody's victim. He's going after somebody who doesn't have that, you know, that wherewithal to, you know, to deflect. So, anyway, so my, my, oh, and so I could say, forgive again the vulgarity, my sense of humor literally saved my ass. Yeah. Um, by the way, if you want to hear the story of my great aunt and uh, finding her with my mother having died by suicide, it's in this, you can use this URL, that's uh, my first TED Talk. Uh, forgive me, by the way, if you see this TED Talk, You'll hear me say something that I no longer say, which is commit suicide. This is Frank King, raw, mental illness. The first time I ever spoke out about my mental illness in public to be recorded, and I wasn't aware that commit suicide was not a 
preferred language. So I have, of course, updated it since then. So just bear with me when you hear it because you know, know that it has changed. Uh, famous people with depression. All these folks live with. So is it possible that the flip side of their depression is whatever it is that powers their careers? Is that possible? Now, when I speak to school kids, middle and high school kids, if you pay close attention to superheroes, if you read between the lines, and sometimes in the lines, oftentimes a superhero has an issue. I would say the Incredible Hulk has a bit of an issue. You know, he's Dr. Banner when he's calm, cool, and collected, kind of bookish, you know, nice guy, unless he gets upset. So I said to my wife, well, I don't get, it doesn't happen to me when I get mad, it happens to me when I get depressed. So she goes, you're the incredible sulk. <laughs> so yeah, this is me when I'm happy. This is me when I'm, uh, so what I do is encourage kids to, to, to adopt or create a superhero, you know, to follow along with the super powers theme. The other day on a plane, I watched the movie Electra with Jennifer Garner. Near the end of the movie, her protege is in a room somewhere, and you can hear Jennifer Garner coming down the wooden sidewalk or whatever toward where she is. Jennifer Garner turns the corner as Electra, the character, the superhero, and her protege goes, Oh, a little OCD? And Jennifer goes, No, I don't have OCD. She goes, Really? Then why were you counting your steps coming down here? So if you look, deeply enough that some of these superhero, well, Superman was shot in space right before his planet, his parents blew up. I'm guessing he's got a little separation anxiety. Batman saw his folks going down, maybe a little PTSD. Spider-Man got bit by a radioactive spider. Okay, I'm not saying they're all equally tragic, but uh, I mean, there's a reason that Batman is the Dark Knight. There's no reason he was the Dark Knight. And I think it does have something to do with the fact he watched his parents gun down. So that's why I encourage kids to, I took a superhero and morphed it, changed the color to blue, because, you know, for me, depressed, blue. And if you look, he's got a, he's sulking. My mother used to say, by the way, when I got like that, don't trip over that lower lid. Because <laughs> that's how I pout, that's how I sulk. And yeah, this, is, <laughs> this is the happy me. Uh, oh, um, bipolar. Again, I'm not a clinician. I believe, just a theory, that bipolar should actually be called tripolar. Because you got manic depressive and then you got that magic space in between the hypomania. And I met a woman recently who, I said, how do they treat you medically, pharmaceutically for the bipolar? She goes, well, Frank, you know, they used to treat me so that I was right to the middle or, or the mean or just below into the depressive state keep me way safely below manic. She goes, my new medication, my new regime is, they've got me at a safe altitude between manic and depressive, and they're doing their best, they're gonna see if they can hold me there. Because you know, you don't want to be in the manic, paranoid rage, hallucinations, can't sleep, sometimes days on end, etc. Or in the depressive phase, um, can't eat, eat too much, can't sleep, sleep too much, lack of energy, Difficulty getting started in the morning, may rally in the afternoon. But if you can be in that middle space, that hypomania, where enthusiastic, energetic, euphoric, uh, charismatic, uh, willing to take inspired risks that if they turn out, it looks brilliant, you just hold people at that altitude. And I don't think the science is there yet, but that's what I'm hoping they'll get to. And I think Johnny Manziel, do you guys know Johnny Manziel? I believe he's a classic case. These are all the things Johnny did. If you're not a football fan, he was the first freshman ever to win the Heisman Trophy. Big deal in college football. You know, he's an All-American, first team All-American, Sports Illustrated, Sporting News, you know, Player of the Year, yada, yada, yada. I believe he achieved a great deal of that. By the way, at this point in his life, through all this, undiagnosed and self-medicating with alcohol. And I believe there's it, there is the, the the um, and these you know these characters I believe this had a great deal to do with 
how much he achieved. And he ended up with the Cleveland Browns and uh, played two years with the Cleveland Browns uh, in professional football. Now, the problem is the depressive state or the manic state landed him here. He's not, the reporters aren't asking him questions about winning the Heisman because in those states, I believe, I don't know if you can see this arrested charge of three misdemeanors, um, suspended him for first half of the season, pulled over by a policeman, something about uh, domestic violence with girlfriend, and then two years with the Cleveland Browns, and they can't. Done. So I believe what got him there brought him down. The good news is, in the last year, he's been diagnosed, in therapy, being treated, and I believe he's having conversations with the New England Patriots about reviving his football career now that he's much more stable. All these people live with or have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Again, is it possible that their talent has some connection, their mental abilities have some connection to perhaps a mental disability? Is it coincidence or? In my TED talk, what I say is, so, is it for, my, for me, it's a matter of if this, then that, what's the connection? If this, my mental ability, is somehow tied to that, my mental disability, what is the connection? I believe the connection is why, and I believe the why is found in evolution. I did some research, and it turns out 100,000 years ago, cavemen and women, anthropologists believe the majority of them were bipolar. And they, it was a survival skill. Because they had four months in the summer, to gather enough food and whatever to last eight months in the winter. So they had to be super hunters, super gatherers, I mean manic, and hypersexual. Because I'm guessing the child mortality, infant mortality rate was high, so they had to be hypersexual to keep up the numbers in the tribe. So they hunted and gathered all summer long, and then when the days grew shorter and the nights grew colder, they believed they slipped into the depressive phase and they just worked on caring to term, birthing the children, and keeping them alive until the following summer. They believe a great number of the people, cave people, men and women, were bipolar. Now, what about other illnesses? All these folks have been diagnosed with OCD. So where's the connection with evolution of OCD? Well, think about this. You've, you've spent four months collecting all this stuff to help you last eight months. It needs to be organized in such a way that it's going to last you eight months. So who better in the tribe to organize that than somebody who is compulsively, compulsive about organizing? And cleaning rituals. I mean, think about it. Somebody in the tribe had to be the person who goes, hey, 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 do not eat that. So I'm guessing back then, the person with OCD was the supply sergeant or the quartermaster they organized everything that everybody collected so that it would last the eight months. And ADD, ADHD. I'm guessing these people in the tribe were sentries. Who better to be watching over the tribe day and night than somebody whose head's on a swivel? Can't sit still. Always. And you know, nowadays we make fun of kids and adults who can't focus or are easily distracted. Squirrel! is the big joke. But back then, I believe ADD, ADHD was a survival, or survival skills. Because it's one thing to go, well, think about this. Back in the caveman time, pretty much everything and anything could, could kill and or eat. So pretty much a good idea to keep aware. And hyper aware is not a bad thing. So nowadays, it's squirrel. Back then, it was probably velociraptor. That's important information to have. And ADHD, by the way, uh, to this day, uh, Native American tribes, whose ancestors were great hunters and gatherers, that, that, that trait is more prevalent in Native American populations than other populations because ADHD was a, they were better hunters and gatherers, they believed back then. So these guys would be my sentries in the tribe, I'm guessing. That's who I'd have standing watch. Dyslexia. This is one of my favorites. And all these people, by the way, have been diagnosed with dyslexia. Do you know dyslexics have better peripheral vision? Something about the wiring. The guy who does my website work, he can put his hand right here where I got my hand and see it. 
I have no idea. <laughs> Some of you know it's there because it's the end of my arm. But the joke I wrote was, never play Where's Waldo for money with a dyslexic because they can spot an anomaly in a flash. You play Where's Waldo with a dyslexic and you got money riding on it, you open the book, the dyslexic's likely to go right there. You can't see that? So they have better peripheral vision. They have the ability to pick out the anomaly. Now, where would that come in handy for a tribe of people 100,000 years ago? These are the people I would have walking point or the scouts. Picture this. We come up to a clearing. There's woods on the other side. Dyslexics tend to not focus like this. They focus more. You've seen those panoramic pictures? They tend to take it in as a whole. And, as I mentioned, they can spot the anomaly. So the rest of the tribe is looking at the trees and bushes across the way, and all they see is trees and bushes. The dyslexic person is likely to go, you see that oak and what looks like a bush right next to it? That's not a bush. That's a guy covered in leaves with a spear. So that would be in the tribe. That would be a survival skill. That would be the, person I would, the persons I would have walking point and doing the scouting. So people who are, are likely to notice the anomaly, what doesn't belong. I was, like I was talking to Michael, the police officer, I've always wanted to be a police officer, and, and somebody said to me, what's the connection? And I said, well, Michael, the police officer, and I, we're paid observers. We get paid to notice things that other people just walk right by. Because in comedy, the funny is often in the anomaly, in what's wrong with this picture. I'm sure in law enforcement, the arrests are in the anomaly. Why is that door unlocked? <laughs> I think there's somebody in there. So that's, that's, that's so I, have, I think I have a little touch of uh, dyslexia. Now. You're probably saying to yourself, Frank, that's all good information, that's all wonderful, that's all interesting, but what is the application today? Let's see if I... Oh, mental with benefits. You don't have to, be mental, don't have, to have mental illness to be famous, but it doesn't hurt. <laughs> yeah, as you've seen my list of people with mental illness. Um, here's what I would do today. If I, was in, if I was king of the world, I would make sure that every child's IED treated whatever mental illness, disorder, they had, but also embraced, enhanced, energized, and celebrated whatever mental abilities, corresponding mental abilities. For example, and let's see if I get these in the right order here. Uh, OCD, OCD. Oh, OCD. I would have them in an individual education plan where the curriculum was chock full of things that required precision and attention to detail. So forget the humanities. <laughs> I would say forget the arts, but I know some people who have OCD who are very good artists. So arts is kind of a gray area. But humanities, the STEM program, which I'm not a big fan of, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, would be ideal for someone who has a personality that, that tends, lends itself to things that require um, attention to detail and precision, and then direct them in a career path that way. You know, th some things that need, things that have just one right answer, like mathematics. There's generally one right answer in math. Engineering, same thing. Um, science, oftentimes, there's just one right answer. Again, that's why I forget the humanities. The reason I study poli sci, political science, in college is because there is no right answer. If you can BS good enough in a paper, you can get a C. And Cs get degrees. So that was my philosophy, because I hated math, because there's only one right answer. I mean, it's not, you might get a few points for showing your work, but other than that, I was sunk. So I would, I would have a kid who has OCD. I would have him in a, you know, in a curriculum that, that played to his strengths, things that required precision attention to detail. Let's see. ADD, ADHD. A friend of mine taught band. He's a professional trumpet player. I met him on the ships. I told him about my TED talk before I did it. He goes, Frank, you know, I taught band in high school. Some of my best kids, most talented, had ADD, ADHD. He said, the problem for me was I could strap them in a chair for 50 minutes, force them, force them to play scales. But what I noticed was after 10 minutes, that next 40 minutes, they didn't get any better. So he got this bright idea. He bought an egg timer. He said, he, and he figured 10 minutes was about the right amount of time. He set the egg timer for 10 minutes. Okay, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna practice your scales for 10 minutes. Ding, 10 minutes gone. Okay, now let's practice our breathing for 10 minutes. Ding, 10 minutes gone. Okay, now let's practice the piece you're doing Saturday at the concert for 10 minutes. Ding, and then he would circle back to the scales. And he said the difference was amazing because they knew they weren't gonna be strapped there for 50 minutes. They didn't have to spend a lot of energy trying to focus and stay still. You know what I mean? 
they're watching, I'm sure they're watching the egg timer, but it's only 10 minutes. He said, I got no scientific evidence, Frank, to back that up. It's strictly anecdotal, but that worked for my kids who were struggling with ADD, ADHD, and they improved markedly from just the strap in the chair 50 minutes to make them, make them do their, um, play their scales. And last but not least, dyslexics. I would have an IED, an individual education plan, that took advantage of their ability to see the anomaly. You know, point them in the direction of a career, like drone pilot. You know, you're the pilotless aircraft flying over whatever, you know, war we happen to be involved in at the time. Um, I'm not endorsing a war, by the way. <laughs> you know, if you could just bring everybody home, I'd be happy. But, um, but yeah, because I said to um, somebody who was dyslexic, I said, here's the deal. Here's what you have over everybody else in the room. You're flying over it, and the desert looks pretty much, you know, rock, scrub, this, that. I mean, all desert sort of stuff. And everybody sees it's just rocks and sand and whatever. And the dyslexic is looking down going, that is not a rock. <laughs> that, that is the uh, lid, I believe, on an underground bunker. Because they can pick out the anomaly. So why not create a, an IEP that, they're also good at multidimensional complex tasks. So bring the humanities back, bring the arts back into the curriculum, forget the STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and play to their strengths and direct them to a career where they were where noticing the anomaly like a police officer. Michael and I talked about that. Where you get paid to notice things. You get paid, or comedian. Comedy's almost always in the anomaly. Comics ask themselves over and over and over in a day's time, what's wrong with this picture? That's where a lot of comedy comes from. Like the joke I told you about Delta Airlines. Nobody else on the plane noticed what she had said. They all heard it. But I'm the only one who went, what, what, small equipment? What, what? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I know. It's, uh, but that's the way I think. So that's, you know, that's, that's the, I'm in the right career. I get paid to pick up on those things. And the longer you do, you know, the longer you do stand-up comedy, the, the better you are at, at spotting the anomaly. I told Michael, I told uh, Michael, for those of you watching the video, Michael's a police officer here in town. I'm sitting at a stop, stoplight the other night. Four in the morning, this car goes by, and it's one of those little cars with a sign on top, some sandwich shop, you know, and the sign's lit. Four in the morning. Now, I'm sure most people sitting there go, they just watch the car go by, hit the blinker, turn, go to the airport. I watched the car go by with a lighted sign on top for a sandwich shop at four in the morning. The cop in me goes, who orders a sandwich at four in the morning? Because, Michael, if I'd been you, it would have been, woo! Because I'm figuring the guy stole the vehicle from somebody's, you know, front yard. And when he pulled the lights on, the light on top came on. That's why the sandwich light is on. But that's, again, that's, I would direct people who have dyslexia to a, a job like that where spotting the anomaly, what doesn't belong, what isn't there, or what is there that should not be, would be that career. So the IEP, I believe that's where, that's the action item for today, is if you have a child who has one of these issues or more, to make sure you work hard to get the IEP to reflect, to, to um, play to their strengths. Start the conversation is a great thing to say, but it's, oh, there's a clock. Um, bless your hearts for not looking at it over and over and over again. Uh, people always ask, how do you start the conversation? You know, it happened this past Thursday in Philadelphia when I was doing a keynote. A young woman during Q&A, I was not talking about depression, but they put that in my introduction. She goes, how do you know if somebody's depressed? Okay, how do you start the conversation? I said, well, let me just run down a couple of things. Um, one, um, as I said, eat too much, can't eat. Sleep too much, can't sleep. Has difficulty getting started in the morning, rallies in the afternoon. Doesn't take joy in the social activities they used to take joy in, oftentimes let their personal hygiene slide. Then she said, what do I say to my friend? I said, well, here's what you don't say. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Turn that frown upside down. Oh, come on, quit whining. Here's what you do say. I'm here for you and mean it. I know you're not crazy, lazy, or self-absorbed. I realize that depression is a mental illness and that with time and treatment, things will get better. I will take the time and mean it, help you get the treatment and mean it. And here's the big one. I said, you need to ask your friend, are they having thoughts of suicide? I said, I, I have difficulty doing that myself, but I, that's the next question. Now there is a school of thought, erroneous, I believe. You should never mention the S word in front of somebody who's depressed. 
And as a comedian, I love the reasoning. Would you guys guess? It might give them the idea. Suicide. What a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? I said to her, trust me, it's crossed their mind. So she said, well, what if they are suicidal? I said, well, next question, do you have a plan? If they have a plan, what is your plan? If the plan is detailed, if they're depressed and thoughts of suicide, plan and detail, it's a very dangerous situation. Oh, by, by, by the way, signs, of, signs they may be suicidal, I'm sorry. Um, they are um, giving away their prized possessions because they want to make sure they go to the people to whom they want them to go to if they're gone. Talking a lot about death and dying, Googling death and dying, death and dying turns up as a theme in their artwork or whatever, right? Um, a counterintuitive one, they're depressed, 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 and all of a sudden happy beyond measure for no apparent reason. It's possible they're happy because they've chosen time, place, nothing. They know the pain is going to end. Then you have the conversation, do you have a plan, what is your plan? And if they do have a plan, then your job, do your best not to leave them alone, get them on the phone with the suicide prevention lifeline or have them text. I believe, sir, it's high to 741 741. Is that correct? 741 741. Yes, and if they won't pick up the phone, you pick up the phone, you call, and the volunteer will do their dead level best, pardon the pun, the pun my mother's sick sense of humor, um, to talk the phone into the hand of the person who's in crisis. Now, one last thing, let me leave you on a high note. The best comedy students I've ever had. I taught a class called Stand Up for Mental Health. It's for people who have an issue and they want to write and perform stand-up comedy wrapped around that issue. You have to have a diagnosis to get in class. You have to have a diagnosis to teach class. It's a guy named David Grenier out of Canada. There are 30 chapters around the United States. Maybe one near here. It was part comedy class, part peer counseling group because everybody had an issue. Everybody had a diagnosis. So nobody was afraid to say anything to anybody because you know whatever happened in the room stayed in the room. And they were the best comedy students, which I believe reinforces my idea of mental with benefits. I'll give you a few examples. Lisa, last name withheld, a comic client confidentiality, double, double uh, diagnosed, alcoholism, depression. She came in one day, she came straight from the AA meeting. She goes, you know what, Frank, I think, and somebody had mentioned Columbus, Christopher Columbus to me. I think Christopher Columbus is um, an alcoholic, or was an alcoholic. Okay, Lisa? Yes, I do. Well, think about this. His big idea, what was it? Sail east to get west. I mean, tell me that's not something somebody comes up with in a bar. And then, like an alcoholic, he did it. Okay? He sailed east to get west. And when he got to where he was going, like an alcoholic, he had no idea where he was. And when he got back, like an alcoholic, he couldn't tell anybody where he'd been. And she said, you got a woman to finance it twice. <laughs> oh. oh, that is sweet. And see, I've taught comics before who were, for the sake of argument, neurotypical. None of them could write a joke that tight. And that's the way it came out of her brain. There's not a syllable in that joke that doesn't move the narrative forward. I had a uh, student, um, oh, Camille, whose backstory, mental health backstory, was just nightmarish. Anyway, she came in one day, she goes, um, let's see my psychiatrist. She goes, so he asked me if I was depressed. I said, yes. Have you thought of suicide? Yes. Do you have a plan? She said, I have five plans. Five plans? She goes, yeah. Want to hear them all? Or just the ones that involve you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's funny. It's dark. But again, there's not a syllable in there that doesn't... I never had to edit anything they wrote. Most comics, they'll write a page. You have to edit out like 95% of it. Because it's all just fluff. Okay, here's my favorite. Uh, Trish. She said, uh, came and she said, hey, my boyfriend last night said he wanted, wanted, me, wanted to break up with me. I said to him, why do you want to break up with me? He said, uh, I want to see other people. So I said, I'm bipolar. Give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's the benefit of Stand Up For Mental Health. They do public shows to help reduce stigma, to change perceptions in hopes of changing prejudices of what someone who has a mental illness or struggles with an issue looks like. So can you imagine, public speaking for most humans is terrifying. This is a Seinfeld joke. Public speaking is the number one fear among, I guess, Americans. That means that at a funeral, 
the person would rather be the person in the casket than the person giving the eulogy. So picture somebody who's already got issues and struggles, standing up on stage, bearing their soul, shining a flashlight into the darkest corners of their existence to mine for humor. To me, that's powerful for somebody in the public who just is unaware of anything to deal with doing mental issues. So, like I said, they were they were the bar none best comedy students I'd ever had, and I do believe it is because of that either mental ableness combined with mental illness, or perhaps just simply a third thing, a a, a mental otherness, just a different wiring altogether. Are you Frank K?